This evening, uh, we're looking at um, a portion of the book of Revelation. Actually, we're going to, in certain senses, uh, look at the book as a whole, but only with regard to what it is that John is actually writing about. Uh, I thought to open up the subject, we could look at the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 1. Let me read you that passage as we begin. And listen carefully to the language of what John is saying here, because we're going to refer to it again and again. He says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this evening. Now again, we've um, been looking at reasons we have to be optimistic about the future. We've seen really a couple of things that should give us a great deal of optimism. The first one is that Jesus is, in fact, reigning. As a matter of fact, we just read about that in Revelation. The one who is reigning over the kings of the earth. And he is in absolute control of all things. And remember, too, that this one who is reigning has, as well, a promise from the Father that all of his enemies are going to be subdued under his feet. Now, we've seen those things so far, and we've also seen some of the indications in Scripture that this is going to have an impact on the world, one which you might say is universally positive. Now, we've also begun to, to look at, or begun to look at, the things that appear to be in the way of an optimistic future, that these things may not be in the way after all, we really saw there's two things of this nature. Passages of Scripture that appear to be warning us of troubled times ahead for the church. Secondly, those passages that seem to indicate that Jesus Christ could come at absolutely any time, what we might call the imminent return. What we've been looking at is the fact that what these things may seem to be in Scripture may not actually be what they are in fact. Last week, we began to look at those passages that seem to indicate that there are troubled times ahead. Uh, passages like um, Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Now, again, I, I'd love to be able to review all of that, but I just, I, I don't have time, of course, but I want to remind you of a couple of things and maybe add a couple of things that I forgot to add last week. And that is that this prophecy, or the prophecy that Gabriel gave to Daniel stated that after the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ basically amounted to 69 uh, weeks of years. Now, Jesus' ministry began at the fulfillment of that time. He wasn't cut off at the end of the 69th week. That's actually when his ministry began. As he begins his ministry in Galilee, just after John was taken into custody, he says this in Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I believe when Jesus said the time was fulfilled, that he was referring, of course, to the time in which he would come into the world, but I think specifically this prophecy that had to do with his coming. After the 62 weeks, 
Messiah comes, or 69 weeks if you include the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Now the prophecy goes on to say that he would establish a covenant with his people for a week, and that's exactly what he began to do, is he began to preach about the new covenant. And in the middle of the week, that the, he would put an end to sacrifice and grain offering, which is what he did when he ratified the new covenant with his own blood, putting an end to the Old Testament sacrifices and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Now, I want you to know that that prophecy went on to say that because he was rejected by his people, that he would send uh, his armies, basically his agents of vengeance, to destroy the holy city and their sanctuary, which is exactly what he did in 70 A.D. Now, the first point we saw was this, that this event that Daniel was speaking about is not in our future. As many people in the church believe today, they're looking for the 70th week of Daniel still after Jesus comes partway, raptures his church, and then brings in uh, or begins the clock again for Israel in the 70th week. This 70th week is something that has already been fulfilled. The middle of that particular week was when Jesus Christ was crucified and put an end to the sacrificial system. As again, we, we noted before that it went on, not, not within the 70th week, but after that, in 70 AD, he talks about the destruction of the holy city and the temple, which as a matter of fact, took place in the past. So this is referring to our past. Now this evening, I want to consider two other passages that appear to stand in the way of an optimistic future. The Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. Now, if it can be shown that Jesus was again speaking of the past rather than the future, it clears the way for us to be more optimistic about what's going to take place with regard to the kingdom of God in this life or in this history before Jesus Christ comes again. It also gives to us, of course, optimism in the work that we have to do. Again, if, if we adopt, let's say, a dispensational view, we can expect things to just be running downhill. And the worse it gets, the more optimistic we get about the second coming of Christ, but the less optimistic we get about how the kingdom of heaven is going to advance, it kind of cripples us in a certain way, in that we're not expecting anything to happen. And you do know that when we pray, we need to pray in faith and expect God for great things. But if you expect God is going to let everything go down, how can you expect great things? However, if you expect it's going to go up, then you have that hope and you have that expectation. You have that faith. You can pray on the basis of what God said he's going to do and expect that that is what he's going to do. Remember, if you're going to pray in faith, you have to know that this is what God has actually promised. Well, let's consider then the Olivet Discourse. And here, we don't have to spend much time because we've already been doing that in the morning service. Again, the question is, is Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, Mark chapter 13, uh, Matthew chapters 24 and 25, uh, Luke chapter 21, speaking about the future with regard to us or the past with regard to us? And again, I believe he's speaking about the past. Now, we just went through this in the Gospel of Mark. Again, I would simply refer you to that for more details, but let me give you the salient points that we needed to see. Jesus, in the Olivet Discourse, was speaking to his disciples, answering their questions regarding the destruction of the temple, the one they were looking at, the one that was then in existence. Jesus said, you see these great buildings. I tell you, not one stone is going to be left upon another which will not be thrown down. His disciples asked the question, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? Now, do you think he was talking or they were asking him his second coming or his coming in judgment to destroy the temple? You see, that's what I believe we're, we're talking about here. And, of course, the end of the age, and now that's up for interpretation. In Mark 13, we didn't have that problem because they didn't ask that question. And so it really isn't addressed there so much as it is in, in Matthew chapter 24. But the end of the age could very well be the end of that old covenant system and God's dealing with Israel as a nation and the moving on to the new covenant people of God, which are believing Jews and Gentiles. But again, 
Jesus is answering his disciples' questions about the temple that was in standing as to when it was going to be torn down. Not about a future temple that would be built even in our future that it's going to be torn down sometime in the future. He's talking about that temple. Now that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus told them what to look for as the event was drawing near. Those things actually happened. He told them what to do when that event actually took place. Even as we saw this morning, showed them what the signal would be for them to run, get out of there. They were looking for it, at least many of them were. They saw it, they ran, they fled the country, and they were safe. He told them what they should do to be ready at all times. Again, they were ready because of the warnings that Jesus Christ had given them, and he even gave them a time frame. That generation would not pass away until all these things took place, and as a matter of fact, that generation did not pass away until all those things actually took place just as he said. So again, Jesus was not speaking about the future, a temple to be rebuilt when the Antichrist makes a, a covenant with the nation of Israel, only to break that covenant with the abomination of desolation, setting up his image in the temple, bringing in the great tribulation. That is fiction. What he was speaking about was something that would happen to that temple that was then standing, about things that were of concern to them because they would be the ones who would live actually to see it come about. So again, he wasn't speaking about our future, he was speaking about our past, even though at the time he was speaking about their future. That's still past to us, 70 AD. The Olivet Discourse does not stand in the way of an optimistic future. Now again, we'll conclude that when we continue to look through Mark 13, but I just wanted to point that out because that is one of the big passages standing in the way. Now secondly, the book of Revelation doesn't stand in the way either. Now what I'd like to do is go verse by verse of the book of Revelation until we get to the end to show you that that is the case. Now obviously, we don't have time to do that because there are 22 chapters in the book. It is a very difficult book to understand. But I do believe, in a very short period of time, I can give you some good reasons why this book is not talking about our future, at least the vast majority of the book, but rather it's speaking about the same event that Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and the Olivet Discourse are referring to, which is actually something that took place in the past, and because it is speaking about that same event. It does not stand in the way of an optimistic future for the kingdom of God on earth. So let's consider some features of the book of Revelation. Some of these things are in the text that we read. Some of these things I'm going to have to ask you either to uh, look up on your own if you're not familiar with them or if you are familiar with them to you know, take this into account as I, as I go through these things. Now, first of all, let's consider who it is that John was writing to. He was writing to seven historic churches. Now, not seven symbolic churches. He wasn't writing to, uh, to simply tell us uh, different states that the church can fall into uh, at any particular time. Sometimes people look at those seven churches and say, well, these are, this represents seven phases the church is going to go through in history or seven states that the church could actually be in at any given time. And, you need to kind of figure out where your church is at and try to do what you can to correct it. No, Jesus was actually addressing seven historic churches that existed in Asia Minor because something was about to happen that was going to affect them. Look, listen to what John says in John, or excuse me, Revelation 1, verses 10 and 11. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice the sound of a trumpet, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now again, why did John, or Jesus I should say, why did Jesus want John to write to them? Well, verse 1 in Revelation 1 tells us to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Now what it is that was about to take place 
is open to interpretation. But I do believe that he was writing to warn them of something that was about to happen that was catastrophic. I hope we can all agree that what's taking place in the book of Revelation is pretty serious stuff. I believe it's referring to the judgment that the Lord was bringing on the Jews for their rejection and crucifixion of his son. Now, some have argued, uh, well, this is going to take place in Jerusalem. What does it have to do with the seven churches in Asia Minor? Well, the fact is there was a war between the Jews and Rome that was throughout the empire because the Jews were spread throughout the empire that lasted for three and a half years. It certainly affected them, especially as it comes to its conclusion in the destruction of the temple. It would certainly affect not only the Jews, but also the Christians. Now, what did John, or when did John say that these things, that he was warning the seven churches about, when did he say these things were going to take place? Well, this is perhaps one of the, the greatest keys to understanding the book of Revelation. He said that it would happen soon. Now, I want you to note that he didn't say these things would begin to happen soon, nor did he say anything that would have led them to believe that the fulfillment of these things was, was thousands of years in the future. But he said the time of their fulfillment was near. Let me give to you several, several examples of this in the book itself in the text we've just looked at in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. We go to the last chapter of the book, chapter 22, verse 6, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Verse 7, and behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly. Verse 12, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. And then verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, whatever it is that John was, was speaking of here, I think it's fairly clear that he at least expected it to happen in the near future, which is why he wanted the churches to pay attention and why he pronounces a blessing on those who read it and those who hear it and actually respond to it in the, in the appropriate way, heed these words because the time is near. And then chapter 22, verse 10, the angel says to John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. So again, the fulfillment of these things, when, when were they going to take place? 2,000 years in the future, which is again what many people see, actually um, hasn't been quite 2,000 years, but getting close to it. Is that what Jesus meant when he said the time was near, when these things would happen soon, that he was coming quickly? There are a number of critics, a number of liberals who look at this and say the Bible can't be true because these things did not come about. Jesus did not come in the time frame that they were expecting. They must have been wrong. This can't be the word of God. Well, I'd submit to you that that is not what they were referring to. It wasn't the second coming. It was the coming of Christ of judgment against the Jews to destroy the holy city and the sanctuary because of their sins against the Lord in killing his son. Now, another key to the understanding this book and exactly when it took place is when the book itself was written. Because you know, there are many who believe the book was written in 90 AD. So it can't be speaking of 70 AD. Whatever it is that John's talking about or Jesus is communicating to him, it has to be in the future. Well, if it was written in 90 AD, there are certainly some things in the book that don't make a great deal of sense. And here's where I'm going to have to draw upon your memory. I will read a couple of things here. For one thing, the temple was still standing when the book was written. Because the angel says to John in Revelation 11 verse 1, get up, 
and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years, the time of the war between the Jews and the Romans. Now, if John wrote this in 90 AD, the angel would be commanding him to get up and measure a temple that had been destroyed 20 years ago. This would not be prophecy. This would be history. But again, notice that when, when the angel tells John to do this, the temple is still standing. Now, notice secondly that in the book of Revelation, the Lord is clearly warning the churches against something that was coming that was catastrophic and something that was coming very soon. It was going to have a tremendous impact upon the church. But from 90 AD to the present time, for almost 2,000 years, if this book were written in 90 AD, nothing like that has really happened. Nothing like this has taken place in history, which is, of course, why many still are looking further into the future for it. But if it were written in 70 AD, certainly there was something catastrophic that took place, a three and a half year war against Rome that lasted for three and a half, well, three and a half years, 42 months, destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. That is catastrophic, certainly affecting the church as well as the Jews. Jesus was, or excuse me, uh, John was writing about a coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, thirdly, in which those who pierced him would see him. Now look at Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And by the way, we're going to look at that terminology next Lord's Day in the morning. What does it mean that they'll see Jesus coming in the clouds? Is that the second coming? Not really. It's the coming of Jesus Christ in judgment, represented in Scripture by a riding on the clouds, riding on the chariots of the heavens, as it were, in judgment against another nation. But he says in, in 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, let me just make a note here that when it says that every eye will see him, it doesn't mean every eye in the entire world is going to see him. It, it, the, the next clause actually explains that even those who pierced him. It doesn't mean even they're going to see him, but what it means is every eye will see him, the eyes of those who pierced him. In other words, the Jews who crucified him are the ones who are going to see him coming in this judgment, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Is this the entire world mourning over him? Not necessarily. That's only one option in, in the Greek language. Another option is this that the tribes of Israel, the tribes of the land, the land of Israel will mourn over him, which is certainly legitimate in the original language. So when Jesus comes, in this particular coming, those who pierced him were going to see him. Even all the tribes of the land would mourn over him. Now was John speaking about the resurrection here at the end of time when the graves are emptied out and they as they're being raised to judgment, they see the one they crucified. Well, many think that that's the case. But it certainly seems more likely that he was referring to 70 AD, when those who pierced him, many, were still living. Ever wondered what Jesus meant when the high priest asked Jesus whether he was the Christ? Jesus says to him in Matthew 26, 64, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus told the high priest that is what he would see. The one responsible for his crucifixion, the one who pierced him, would see him, which is exactly what John is telling us. He would see Jesus coming in judgment against Jerusalem in order to fulfill the threat that he had issued earlier, which is your house would be left to you desolate. So again, 70 AD, was it referring to 70 AD? That's a good reason to believe it was written prior to 70 AD. Now in this vision, we're also told that, that a sixth king, 
represented by the sixth head of the beast would be ruling or was ruling at that particular time. In chapter 17, verse 7, and verses 9 and 10, let me read those for you. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the, women, the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Now let me just simply say this, that Ken Gentry, who's done a great deal of uh, research on this, believes that the seven heads refer to seven kings of the Roman Empire, because notice he says, the seven heads are seven mountains. Rome is built on, on, uh, in a place where there are seven hills, the seven hills of Rome. But they also represent seven kings whom he believes to be Caesars. Now who was the sixth of these Caesars? Well, he believes it's Caesar Nero, who reigned from 54 AD to 68. And again, if the sixth king is in fact Nero, that would put then, if he's the one reigning during the, the time this vision was given, that five have already fallen, one is, and there's one that's yet coming, that would mean that the book was written prior to 70 AD. Now John also indicates that the tribulation that he is warning them of in some sense has already begun. Now this is something that's interesting. Again, we're looking at a date which is around 68. The fall of Jerusalem was in 70. There was a three and a half year war between the Jews and Rome that actually ended in 70 AD with the destruction of the city and the temple, which means that tribulation would have begun earlier than that. Again, the 42 month period. But this is what John says in John chapter one, verse nine. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He doesn't say he was a fellow partaker in tribulation, but in the tribulation. And you know in the Greek when the definite article is used, and it is the same as true in English, it's referring to a particular tribulation believe the one that John was writing about that Jesus was showing him. Now again, if this is correct, if this is, if what we understand here is correct with regard to the temple standing and uh, the sixth head reigning and the catastrophic event that was very near and so forth, then it would place the date of the book of Revelation shortly before 70 AD. And if that's true, then it would make a lot more sense out of what John is saying as he's warning the churches about something which is shortly going to take place, as we saw in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. If this was written in 68, 70 is pretty near. If it was written in 90 and nothing has happened for 2,000 years, how can we say it matters, it, it mattered at all to them to read it and to heed it? Because it didn't apply to them. It applies to a future generation. This it wouldn't make any sense, I hope you can see. If it was written again in 90 AD and it had nothing to do with 70 AD and so forth, what John is saying here just would not make any sense. Now, does this mean that everything in the book has been fulfilled? Well, not necessarily, because it does contain certain things that have to do with what takes place between his first and second coming. It tells us about the release of Satan at the very end of what we call the millennium. It, it talks about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in fire to destroy his enemies. It talks about the raising of all the dead to the final judgment, the great white throne judgment. It talks about the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth and what those are going to be like. These are in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, chapters 20 through 22. It doesn't mean that everything has been fulfilled in the book of Revelation, but it does mean that a great majority of what it's speaking of has I believe it's dealing with exactly the same theme that Daniel was 
was, well, Gabriel was telling Daniel in Daniel 9, verses 26 and 27. Again, listen, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Okay, Daniel is referring to the destruction of the city and of the temple. The Olivet Discourse. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 38, as he's prefacing the Olivet Discourse, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets, kills those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And that's when he goes on to describe what's going to take place that's going to leave the house of Israel desolate. He's referring to God's judgment against the Jews in 70 AD for their spiritual adultery, for their murdering of the Messiah, for their persecution of the church. Again, the point is, in, in the book of Revelation, all of the discourse, and Daniel chapter 9, these events are in the past. These things have already been fulfilled. And so they do not stand in the way of the optimism that we can have that Christ's reign and the subjection of his enemies are going to make a profound impact on the world in which we live, notwithstanding what we see taking place now. The Lord could change these things overnight if it is his will. And the fact is, it appears that that is his will. Now, next time, we're going to consider the second objection, which is if Jesus could come at any time, then how could there be a glorious future yet for the church on earth? If the imminent coming of Christ is true, then how could we expect there to be really anything in the future because Jesus could come before the end of the sermon? He could come tomorrow, which means there may not be a glorious future. If he comes tomorrow, we haven't seen one yet, so we're not gonna see one. So again, can Jesus come at any time? Is his coming eminent, as it were, for his church. Well, again, that's what we're going to look at last time or next time. But for now, let's just remind ourselves again of, of what it is we have to be encouraged by. Jesus is reigning now. He is in absolute control of everything that's going on. Um, you know that everything that takes place in this world, including the things we see daily, in the newspaper, though many people don't want to admit, even Christians, somehow God isn't in control of these things. They're happening outside of his control. If, if the Lord had the world he wanted, we wouldn't have these kinds of things taking place. As a matter of fact, this is the world that the Lord has made. This is exactly what he wants to be taking place. If he wanted it otherwise, he would make it otherwise. He has the power to do that. He has a reason. He has a purpose behind what he's doing. And we don't fully understand specifically what it is for each of the things that are taking place, but we do know that as we continue to see God's plan unfold, that we will eventually understand it. We may not understand it from here. We may understand it from there in heaven, but we will see the Lord work all these things together for good. Jesus is reigning, and he is in absolute control which is why we are to pray to him that he would do the things that the Lord has told us that we ought to pray for, such as bringing about subjection of all men under his feet. By the way, we should tie that together with the promise the Father has given to Jesus that he will subdue his enemies under his feet. One day every knee will bow. Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to pray that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means that every knee would bow before him and we've also seen many indications in Scripture that that is going to make a profound difference in this world. So all these things should give us hope that our efforts to advance the kingdom are not going to be in vain. Our prayers seeking the Lord for the, his blessings upon this world to advance the kingdom of heaven, to subject his enemies, 
even if we don't see it in our lifetime, because we don't know the Lord's timetable, the Lord will still hear and answer those prayers in his timetable. Our prayers he will still use to that end. We're not wasting our time. As we go out to share the gospel with others, we're not wasting our time because the Lord is going to use that too to advance his kingdom, which is the reason why he's commanded us to do it. So with this hope in front of us, we know that our work is not in vain in the Lord. And I do, again, believe that we can be optimistic about what's going to take place in the future, that God is actually going to use these things in this world for his glory and the glory of his son. Now, again, like I said, there's a great deal of optimism for those of you who are the Lord's. But I, I would again remind you that these things are only true for those who are believers. If you are not a believer, the future is not optimistic for you. The future is actually quite gloomy, but it can be optimistic if you will simply trust in the Lord. Trust in him, turn from your sins, submit to him. The Bible says one day every knee is going to bow to him. It doesn't mean necessarily from the heart in the sense of out of love. The Bible says that if you will bow the knee before him now out of love and receive him as your Lord and as your Savior, that you will be saved. You will be safe. But if you do not bow the knee before him willingly now, one day you will bow the knee, but it won't be from the heart and it won't be to receive him as your Lord and Savior, but rather it will be as judge. So make sure that you bow the knee before him now, that you might be ready for that day, and also that you might look forward to the rest of us to this optimistic future that the Lord has planned for us. Well, may the Lord again grant us his blessing and uh, again give us the optimism we need to push forward. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer. Let's, um, let's ask the Lord to, to help us um, here and heed, heed in this sense by believing what it is the Lord has told us and then, of course, by acting on that belief in the way that we